Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. By the way, please be sure to follow us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash UNC knowledge. The best-selling author of America Alone, The End of the World as We Know It, Mark Stein publishes regularly in National Review, The Washington Times, Investors Business Daily, and in venues in Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom, a one-man Commonwealth Association, and he is a frequent guest host for Rush Limbaugh. Mark, the end of the world as we know it. First mm -hmm. question, you mean that as a provocative overreach to get everyone's attention? No, I think, I think we are at the end. Like all Cassandras, you, you write a book warning about the apocalypse in hopes that you can, can ward it off. But I think whether we do ward it off or not, we are at the end of the post-World War II global order, and, uh, and a lot of things have to be rethought as a consequence of that. Segment one, the numbers. Let's just lay out the demographic argument. I'll quote from America alone. This book is about the larger forces at play in the developed world that have left Europe too enfeebled to resist its remorseless transformation into Eurabia and that call into question the future of much, much of the rest of the world, including the United States, Canada, and beyond. The key factors are, one, demographic decline, two, the unsustainability of advanced Western social democratic states, and three, civilizational exhaustion. So we'll take each of those in turn. Demographic decline, the argument. Well, Europe uh, has simply given up, for the most part, having children. Uh, if you take uh, the Mediterranean countries, for example, we tend to think of them in our stereotypical way as big fecund cultures, big Italian mamas, big, uh, big Greek mamas, my big fat Greek wedding, right. big fat Greek loving family. In fact, they have collapsed uh, birth rates. Uh, Germany, uh, Japan, and Italy are already in net population decline. They have upside down family trees. They have four grandparents uh, with two children and one grandchild. Uh, that doesn't have to go on for a long time until you're in serious trouble and you reach a point uh, beyond which you can't uh, recover. And that's what a lot of European countries are at now. Now, some of them are just going out of business. If you look at Eastern Europe, uh, some of the countries that were, uh, until 20 years ago, part of the Soviet bloc, uh, they gave up having children and they're in population decline and there's no successor population. What happened in Western Europe is slightly different. Um, in effect, Western Europe imported a large Muslim population uh, to be the children it couldn't be bothered having themselves. And the Muslim birth rate is? Well, the Muslim birth rate is said to be, because, you know, in a politically correct culture, they don't keep a lot of uh, official figures on this. But compared to the average uh, ethnic European birth rate, where they have 1.3 children per couple, the, uh, the, Muslim, uh, the estimated Muslim population is 3.5. Now, the official British statistic from the official British government statistics office says that the Muslim population of the United Kingdom is growing 10 times faster than the general population. Uh, that doesn't have to go on long uh, for the numbers to even out. If you say have a, I mean, people think it takes a long time, but if you say have a 90% uh, population uh, that so let's not let's not make it any kind of racial thing. Let's call them the Munchkins. Say right. ninety percent Munchkins, uh, and they have one point three uh, children per couple. And then you have a ten percent ethnic minority. You can call them call them the Ruritanians. Call them whatever you want. But they have three point five children. That ninety percent and that ten percent will have uh, roughly the same number of grandchildren. So in other words, in two two generations is all you need, and you've caught up. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, you write in America alone, today's, I'm quoting you, today's high Muslim birth rates will fall and probably fall dramatically as the Catholic birth rates in Italy and Quebec have. Question, what is your underlying theory of what drives birth rates? Why would the Muslim birth rate fall? Well, uh, I, I think there's two kind. I think there's two kinds of things that drive birth rates. Right. One is it's basic kind of economic improvement. Uh, people move from a primitive agricultural society where you don't need large numbers of children to work the farm into uh, more developed societies where you need fewer numbers of children. What's happened in Europe has gone beyond that, though. Mm -hmm. uh, in effect, uh, the social democratic state has said, you don't need to worry about children or grandchildren you, uh, or anything like that anymore. You're taken care of from cradle to grave. 
uh, the, there's a relatively high price in taxation to be paid for that, and that's why having a child is expensive uh, in the modern world today. So people have fewer children because it's, uh, it's an economic liability. So if you don't have to have them, why have them? 40% uh, of German female university uh, graduates are childless. We, we talk about the maternal instinct, uh, but evidently it, it isn't that instinctive, not if you're, not if you're German. If you're French or German. Mm. So give me, by the way, this, this business about the Muslim birth rate falling, I have the feeling in reading America alone that you're, you almost toss that to the opposition because even that need not necessarily be the case. Well, well, I, as witness say in the Church of Latter-day Saints in Utah, they leave, Salt Lake City is a completely modern town, right. but it has the highest birth rate in the United States. Yes. That is to say, it's not necessary. No, but, no, and that's why the Mormons have spilled uh, the banks of Utah and why uh, Mitt Romney can be running as a Mormon candidate for president from Massachusetts. Uh, it, they've outgrown the state in, in a basic sense. And I think you can see similar things in, in Britain. For example, uh, Pakistani immigration went down for the first generation. Pakistani birth rates went down for the first generation of Pakistani immigrants in the 1970s. Something very odd happened then in the 1980s and 90s that it started creeping back up again. In other words, as soon as there was a big enough Pakistani population in northern England to be able to live in a kind of Pakistani culture, uh, they resumed uh, Pakistani-style uh, fertility rates. So I accept, and I, off, I, can, I concede that point immediately, that the more that certain Muslim birth rates are falling. But which ones are they? They're, they're generally speaking, the more moderate ones. The Tunisian fertility rate mm. is a Western fertility rate. In Turkey, why is Turkey, uh, why, why is Kemal Ataturk's Turkey turning into uh, just another uh, Islamist uh, society? Because uh, the Kemalist, uh, Westernized Turks, have a Western birth rate, and that great, vast Turkish rural hinterland in the east retained a traditional Muslim birth rate, spilled its banks, like the population in Utah, and moved into the cities. And that's why, whatever happens to Turkey, uh, Kemalist Turkey is dead, gone, over. And if the Pentagon and the State Department don't get that, they shouldn't be in those buildings. Segment two, the unsustainable habits of the West, again from America alone, quote, the European welfare state depends on economic growth and population growth. The former is now barely detectable and the latter is already in reverse." Mm -hmm. Close quote. Explain why the welfare state in Europe depends on both economic and population growth. First, first your premise. Well, if, if, if you don't have welfare, a, a declining population is not a big problem. I mean, it's a problem in a kind of cultural sense that you won't have a very hip pop music business if, if you've got very few young people. Right. Uh, but I actually, that, personally, that would suit me uh, just fine. I don't want a lot of young. You and I would be happy with yeah. Frank Sinatra. Yeah, right. that, I'd be. I would be happy to have uh, Doris Day and and trade Lady Gaga to wherever she wants to move to. So if you lose your young people, you have certain cultural consequences, right. but not necessarily economic ones. I mean, my town in New Hampshire, uh, the population peaked in the uh, 1810 census. Uh, and then what happened, uh, the sheep farming industry in New Hampshire collapsed, people moved out to the west, people moved to the mill towns in southern New England, and my town's population declined all the way till the 1940 census. But it didn't matter because we didn't have a welfare state right. predicated on uh, the basis that there would be sufficient young people to pay for the retirements of uh, the old people. Now, when we say retirement, by the way, we're talking about a problem that most societies before ours never had. If you, if you look at Greece, uh, something like uh, the best part of 300 professions in Greece, uh, you're allowed to take retirement at 50. 50. So in other words, you, uh, you work from, you know, 20-something to the age of 50, and then you spend three decades living at somebody else's expense. Well, who's going to be that somebody else? Uh, if you don't have any children, you've got to import someone to be the somebody else. And, and the people uh, that, uh, that uh, Europe decided to import were Muslims. Almost every issue facing the European Union, I'm quoting again from America alone, from immigration rates to crippling pension liabilities has at, it, has at its heart the same root cause, a huge lack of babies. Mm -hmm. Close quote. Give me a kind of summary statement, if you can, on why France, as we know it, can't survive under the current birth rate. 
Well, it depends on what you think a nation is. If a nation is just a zip code, uh, if a nation is a, a gate at LAX and it just happens to be an accumulation of the people who are standing around in the gate uh, waiting for whatever until their flight is called, then yes, there will be a France and there will be a Netherlands and there will be an Italy and a Germany. But if you okay. think that a nation uh, is the accumulated inheritance of its past, uh, then there will be no France and there will be no Germany and there will be no Italy. It's just a, a couple of days ago, a, um, a, a, a prominent politician in Angela Merkel's uh, party in Germany called for the removal of crucifixes from German schools. Germans are, are post-Christian like most of Europe, but it, it is part of their cultural inheritance that, there, that, that you will still see crucifixes displayed in German schools. Uh, this Muslim lady is making the point that this now... Uh, the official was a Muslim? Yes, this is a, a Muslim member of Angela Merkel's uh, party in Germany. And she's making the reasonable point uh, that these crucifixes no longer speak to uh, what Germany is and more to the point what Germany will be in 20 years. So they're going to go. Uh, um, it doesn't even have to be anything that basic. Um, if you look at British pubs, you look at the English village pub. Is there going to be a need for an English village pub? I mean, if you, you know English villages well from your, uh, from your university days, Peter. Right. You know, if you go to those villages in Oxfordshire, uh, you'll have a tiny little main street on which there'll be six, seven, eight thriving pubs. Right. Now, once that population becomes 20, 30 percent Muslim, how many of those pubs are still going to be in business? Uh, so it, it affects everything. It transforms. You, you can't have this kind of population transformation without having a broader uh, cultural, socioeconomic and political transformation, too. OK, so let me tell you what I think of when I think of France. One, nominally, but still nominally, Catholic. Two, rigid separation between church and state, the laïcité yeah. uh, policy. Three, a vivid sense of playing, having played a role in European history. Some sense, because the French educational system is pretty good at history as best I can make it out, the kids will understand Napoleon and the revolution and the long line of French kings through Louis IX all the way back to Pepin. So they will place themselves in relation to the long story of European history. Give me what France will look like, how those three aspects of what I think of as French will be changed in 20 years, say. Well, for the or is 20 years too little? Am I, being, am I taking... No, no, I don't think so. I think, in 20, I think in 20 years' time, I think, I mean, just to take, you mentioned schools. I mean, right. if you look, take, for example, Antwerp in Belgium, 40% of the children in Antwerp elementary schools select uh, Islamic studies as their religious uh, studies class versus 26% uh, for Catholic and uh, roughly the same number for uh, non-confessional studies. So in other words... Uh, that is the future of Antwerp. So 20 years' time, uh, all those grade schoolers are going to be in their late 20s and early 30s. So you're not wrong. We're, we're, that's the time frame we're talking about. And in France, most of those Catholic schools, mm. uh, uh, most of those Catholic churches are going to be closed. Uh, maybe they'll be re some of them will be retained as heritage sites, uh, but they're not going to be living Catholic churches. If you think of uh, what was once St. Sophia's uh, Cathedral in uh, in uh, Istanbul, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, now a museum. Uh, so you can go and see, uh, you, you, you can go and see what was once there, but it's no longer a going concern. And that's what those Catholic churches will be like. You talk about the history that's taught in French schools. They're not going to be teaching the Second World War in French schools because it's going to be problematic. Uh, mm. the, the Turks were on the wrong side. Uh, well, and the uh, and beyond that, uh, the whole question of the Holocaust becomes uh, contentious right. when you're teaching it to Muslim school children. That's why Dutch schools, for example, decide discretion is the better part of valor, and it's easier just to skip the whole Second World War. British schools increasingly find it's easier to skip the Crusades. So, so when you have this kind of uh, essentially population transformation, it changes not only the present and the future, but it even changes the past, because the past has to be retrospectively brought into line with a new, some kind of new national narrative. Segment three, civilizational exhaustion. Again, America alone, quote, a suicide bomber may be a weak weapon, but not against a weak culture. Explain that. 
Yeah, the, the essentially uh, Islam has bet uh, that we we have expensive toys. We we've got the best kind of aircraft carriers. We've got the best kind of tanks. Uh, we've got the smart bombs. Uh, but that and that's that's a short term advantage. If you want to pick a fight on a battlefield, if you want to pick a fight that is uh, slightly more ambiguous. Uh, that doesn't actually, never actually calls out the force you're up against onto, a, uh, have a, onto the battlefield for a big tank battle, then what matters is will. What matters is will. And uh, they have bet that the West does not have uh, the will to defend itself. And they see that uh, every day of the week. For example, in the way uh, Comedy Central just a couple of days ago right. caved in and censored the show South Park. I don't really know much about South Park. I, I don't uh, I don't watch it particularly. I don't have a TV reception worth speaking of. Um, but I, uh, but 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 one thing I do know is that uh, ten years ago, South Park was able to do a Mohammed joke, and it went on the air, and it was broadcast, and nobody threatened to kill anybody over it. Right. What has happened since then uh, is is that we have taught these uh, people the lesson that if you threaten to kill uh, and you threaten to murder and you threaten to intimidate, you don't actually have to kill or murder anyone. Uh, the culture will just cave anyway. All right. You identify a couple of sources of this civilizational exhaustion. Let me try to ask you for an explanation of each. Again, I'm quoting from America alone. Most mainline Protestant churches are to one degree or another post-Christian. Mm. They hold, actually I'm quoting this sentence just because I love the sentence, deep breath. They hold that if Jesus were alive today, he'd most likely be a gay Anglican bishop in a committed relationship, driving around in an envirom environmentally friendly car with an arms or for hugging sticker, yeah. close quote. The West is exhausted because it has ceased to believe. Well, I think it has ceased to believe in anything. Um, and by that, I mean, it's not necessary uh, for everyone in a Western nation to be a believing and observant Christian. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand, uh, I think, that your, your civilization springs uh, from a relatively narrow uh, foundational source. I, I find it, I'm, I, I like atheists, but I must say I find the quality of atheism has deteriorated dramatically over the last century. Um, if you go back, uh, go back to the late 19th century when, when uh, Nietzsche declared that, that, that God is dead, he at least respected God enough to want to pick a fight uh, over his existence or not. Uh, there's, that's something slightly more sophisticated uh, than if you look at uh, Richard Dawkins or, for example, Christopher Hitchens, a smart guy, a man I like very much, yes. a man who is on the right side of most things. But Christopher Hitchens says uh, religion poisons everything. I don't think, I don't understand how you can look at most of the great artwork of Western civilization. I don't understand how you can listen to Mozart or Brahms and say that. You, it's not necessary to be an observant Christian to hear the beauty uh, in, a, uh, in a great uh, 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 European requiem mass that springs from that Christian tradition. And so the idea of uh, trashing our, our civilization in the interests of, I think, a, uh, a multicultural nullity, um, I think has been a disaster. And I think it's left a great big hole where our identity ought to be. Second cause of civilizational exhaustion, <clears throat> you argue, and I quote again from America Alone, quote, the populations of wealthy democratic societies expect to have total choice over their satellite TV packages, yet think it perfectly normal to allow the state to make all the choices in respect of their health care. The torpor of the West derives in part from the annexation by government of most of the core functions of adulthood. Hmm. Close quote. Explain that one. Well, I don't think it's very difficult. I think if you, if you take a picture of uh, the average 13-year-old uh, in California today, and then you and then you take a picture of a 13-year-old from, um, say, my part of New Hampshire, circa 1878. Just put those photographs side by side. Which one would you be willing to leave your house to if you were to go away for a weekend? Mm -hmm. I don't think it. I don't think it's. I don't think it's a very difficult question to answer. That now that's fine when you're 13, but what happens when you extend adolescence? The the President of the United States has just told us that if you're 26 years old, you can stay on your parents' um, 
health insurance, uh, health insurance plan. So he's basically said at 26, you're still a child. Childhood extends to 26. Right? On your 27th birthday, you've got to finally shape up and move out of your parents' uh, insurance agency. But until then, you're a child. Uh, what, what the problem with that is that I think we have essentially uh, created a society of permanent adolescence where the important business Healthcare, healthcare. Why, why is it that people could make their own healthcare arrangements 50, 100, 200 years ago, but that now the state uh, has to do it for us? And what does that say about us? What kind of, when you insulate people from, when you insulate your citizens from all the most basic pressures of life, what kind of citizenry do you wind up with? And that's why I do think we uh, are creating essentially a society of permanent adolescence where, where we, we, we talk about our iPods, we talk about the music we listen to, uh, we talk about our cable packages, uh, whereas everything important, the decisions are made for us by the government. Segment four, Stein and his critics. The Economist magazine called your book, quote, an alarmist's creed. The Guardian, one of Britain's leading newspapers, said, quote, Stein's book is indeed alarmist. Maclean's magazine, for which, you, magazine. For which you write. <laughs> Maclean's, the Canadian, the Canadian magazine, called the book once again alarmist. Mm -hmm. Why can't you put your argument more calmly? <laughs> you have something important to say. Why not say it in a way that appeals to the intellectuals who have the, their hands on the levers of power? Uh, because I think it's actually happening so fast that, that uh, if we want to do anything about it, we need, we need to do it quickly or the entire Western world is going to be out of business. What I find fascinating, really, after uh, publishing the book um, is, is that, uh, is that the, the progressive mind denies there's anything to argue about. You know, some people will pick a fight with me and say, oh, the idea that, uh, the idea that Europe will be Muslim by uh, the year 2030 is absurd, uh, maybe by 2070 or 2100. Right, right, right. So in that case, we're not arguing about the destination. Rates, right. We're only arguing about the, the length of the journey. But more and more people say, well, what would be so wrong? What would be so wrong if, uh, if the Western world did become Muslim? Uh, and that, I think, is the, the self-neutering result of the, um, uh, of, of the multicultural mindset. You remember Mayor Nagin in, uh, in, in New Orleans. He, uh, when uh, it turned out that uh, a lot of the people who'd moved away didn't want to come back, he got all worried about that because he said New Orleans has always been, quote, a chocolate city, unquote. Mm -hmm. In other words, he thought uh, that, that the... That that who lived there made a difference to what the city was. Why can't you make that point about Italians in Milan? Uh, why can't you make that point about Swedes in Malmo? Why can't you make that point about Dutch people in, in Rotterdam? Uh, and I, I think that's, that, well, that's what I find fascinating, that the leftist progressives say, well, what's the big deal if the, if the whole world becomes Muslim? What would be wrong with that? Right. Um, and I think what is, what the, the response to that is, well, look, you know, um, okay, which currently Muslim city would you want to live in? Exactly. I, li I, like, her, I like the Muslim world. I spent a lot of time in the Muslim world. I love uh, Amman. Uh, I love Cairo. I love visiting them. But would I want to raise a family uh, in Cairo? Would I want to try and do business in Cairo? Uh, would I want to try and exercise my uh, right to free speech even in Jordan, which is a supposedly moderate Muslim uh, state? No. I'm, I'm very happy to visit them, uh, but I'm very happy to come home to free, pluralist Western societies. All right, let's move on to a critic of yours <clears throat> who plays fair to the extent that he certainly doesn't want all of Europe to become radical mm. Muslim and understands that something is, is, is at stake. Christopher Hitchens, quote, Stein makes the same mistake as did the late Italian journalist Oriani Falacci, considering European Muslim populations as one. Little binds a Somali to a Turk or an Iranian or an Algerian, and considerable friction exists among immigrant Muslim groups. Argument one. Argument two. Moreover, many Muslims actually have come to Europe for the advertised purposes seeking asylum and to build a better life. Close quote. Calm down. Those 40% in Antwerp don't get along that well with each other in the first place, and some of them are there because it's Antwerp. Mm. They get to be less Muslim and more secular. Well, I think the, I think the way to look at that is, uh, uh, with respect to Christopher Hitchens, is I think that was true uh, uh, a couple of generations back. 
I think, for example, if you take a Pakistani immigrant to um, Scotland, that just happens to be an example, um, a real-life example I happen to know, 1950. Right. Uh, that Pakistani immigrant to Scotland uh, would have had a broadly similar education to the guy in Scotland. Uh, so, in other words, he's, he's coming to a land uh, that he has been raised, in a sense, to live in. He's coming to the imperial metropolis right, right, from the right. fringe. Uh, so he, he already comes semi-assimilated. Now you take a Pakistani immigrant who comes in the year 2010. He's, he'll have been educated in a madrasa. Uh, he'll know Islam, but not much else. He's far more foreign in that sense to Scotland than he would have been uh, 50 or 60 years ago. But the, also I think there is a difference. Uh, and this is where the numbers come into play, that it is, was simply not possible to live in a Muslim world in inner city Scotland in 1950, whereas it is now. What you see in uh, Malmo, Sweden, where Jews are fleeing in the most progressive society in Europe, uh, social democratic Scandinavia, Jews have concluded there's no future for them in Malmo and they're getting the hell out of there. Why? Because it's, it's a Muslim city. And in a sense, uh, there are so many Muslims in Malmo uh, that Sweden has assimilated with Islam rather than the other way around. So I think, I think with respect to Christopher Hitchens, he profoundly um, underestimates, uh, uh, overestimates westernization. And Christopher should know this. There's a fascinating series of uh, pictures that was published on the internet uh, a, a couple of uh, months ago showing the, uh, showing the gra female graduating class from Cairo University in 1958 1979, and I think 2004. 1958, they're all bareheaded women. They look, like, they look like young women, more or less not terribly different from young women you would have seen at the time uh, in, uh, in Western Europe or anywhere else. By 1979, uh, half of them are covered. 2004, they're all covered. It's the, it's the arrogance, I think, it's the arrogance even of the left to assume that the, 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 the societal pull is always in the direction of westernization. In the Muslim world, that is not the case. It's gone backwards, and I, and I think you can see evidence already that it's going backwards in northern England and other uh, heavily Muslim parts of Europe. Segment five, <clears throat> your title, America Alone. You sum up... European disdain for the United States by quoting the British journalist Brian Reed, who writes that Americans are, quote, self-righteous, gun-toting, military-loving, sister marrying, abortion hating, gay loathing, foreigner despising, non-passport owning rednecks. Hmm. To which Mark Stein replies... I think you left out the most colourful bit of that I did, uh, Well, there's the a bit that's uh, rather uh, vivid mixturations. Go ahead, toss it in. Yeah, he, he see, he, who think that uh, I think God gave them uh, the most, uh, the, the biggest... Uh, uh, manhood in the world, I'm being discreet there, yes, so right. that they could urinate on the rest of the planet. It's something right. like that. Something so, like that. To which Mark Stein replies, if one were to formulate it less disapprovingly, mm -hmm. Brian Reed's Anatomy of Americans equals, quoting, uh, quoting you now, culturally confident, self-reliant, patriotic, procreative, religious, democratic, constitutional rednecks who believe in national sovereignty rather than ineffectual poser multilateralism, close quote. What makes the United States different? Well, I think, I think the United States is still different. I think it's clear that there's a big slab of the population here that is attracted to the idea of being like Europe. Uh, Europe has only been able to be like Europe the last 60 years because uh, the United States has, uh, has served as the guarantor of last resort. In effect, Germany doesn't need an army because the U.S. Army lives in Germany, uh, and so Germany has been free to spend its defense budget on uh, socialized health care and all kinds of other things. In effect, U.S. taxpayers pay for the German health care system. In 2010, this year, we still have 50,000 troops, what, 60-some mm -hmm. years after the end of the... After the end of the Second World War, we still have 50,000 troops in Germany. Right, uh, which, is, which is ridiculous. And any time anybody talks about uh, withdrawing them, as Secretary Rumsfeld does, uh, the, argument, the argument now uh, that was advanced at the time is that the closure of those bases would be devastating for surrounding German supermarkets and restaurants. Right. So that is why the United States taxpayer pays to keep this vast army in Germany is because otherwise those supermarkets and restaurants would go out of business. So, so if 
America goes down the European path, who is going to be the, the sugar daddy for America in the way that America served as the sugar daddy for Europe? Uh, there isn't one. Uh, but what heartens me is that um, America is not yet European. I was very despondent by the results of the, as you can imagine, of the 2008 election. But what was interesting to what was interesting to me is the is the nature of the rebellion against that. There was the financial crisis, which happened in a lot of countries, and in a lot of places, from Iceland to Bulgaria, you had uh, massive demonstrations of people pounding on the door of Parliament, saying, "Why didn't you, the government, do more for us?" This is the only country in the Western world where a mass protest movement rose up saying, uh, why don't you do less for us? Why don't you get the hell out of our pocket? Uh, why don't you keep out of our lives, big government, and we do just fine? And it doesn't, it's not clear to me whether it speaks for 50.001% of the American people, but it speaks it's for a significant there. chunk of them. And that differentiates uh, the United States uh, from the, uh, most of the other Western nations. You write, Mark, <clears throat> There are three possible resolutions to the, to the present struggle. Again, I'm quoting from America alone. One, submit to Islam, but that would mean the end of Western civilization. Two, destroy Islam, but, quote, the slaughter would change America beyond recognition, close quote. Three, reform Islam, but, quote, ultimately only Muslims can reform Islam. All the free world can do is create conditions that increase the likelihood of Muslim reform, close quote. What kinds of conditions are those? Well, I, I think historically, uh, Islam <clears throat> has only been moderated by, by the overarching society. I mean, to, a, to an extent, the British Raj moderated Islam in India. It had problems with uh, Wahhabist violence in the 19th century. They assassinated a, um, a, a viceroy and a chief justice in, uh, in imperial India. But generally speaking, uh, you know, the British, the British Raj uh, did have a moderating impact. The Indonesian dictatorship had a moderating impact on radical Islam. Uh, the Soviet Union did. The Central Asian stands uh, were very agreeable places to be when the Soviet Union bust up. They have this disgusting alcohol they drink there. They're incredible. They're the world's most relaxed Muslims drinking this, this, this hooch. Uh, very pleasant company. What happened was that the Iranians and Saudis then spent a ton of money radicalizing those people. So th that teaches us a lesson. The lesson here is, is if you're not playing, if you're not on ideological offense, you're going to get rolled. This idea that somehow our deference to Islam prevents us from, to make the Christopher Hitchens point, identifying the, 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 the various mom and pop strains of Islam around the planet that we're in favor of, or just letting the House of Saud and the Iranian mullahs annex anything that takes their fancy is a recipe for disaster. Uh, none of those, none of those uh, precedents are attractive to Americans because Americans don't think the Indonesian dictatorship or the Soviet Union or even the British Raj are terribly attractive. So, so they're not in the ideological game. What's the program for the United States? Well, I think if you, if you could simply, if you, we set Barack Obama to one mm -hmm. side and make you president. Or let's see, let's do it for, 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 for experimental purposes, for the purposes of mental experiment, let's make you dictator. What should the United States do? Well, for a start, I would, I would end ideological subversion uh, of, uh, of the United States and the Western world. I don't, I don't think... You tell the Saudis, you stop supporting, uh, yeah. exporting Wahhabism yeah, well, yeah, now. Yeah, because basically uh, the, the Saudis export ideology, not oil. Oil simply funds the export of ideology. And I would, I, would, uh, I would stop that, and I would do everything to stop it. I think the tragedy is that the Saudis are reaching the point where they've just about bought up everything they need to buy up in the Western world. Secondly, I do think that unless, you're, uh, unless you have uh, real serious cultural confidence, you should not have mass Muslim immigration. My, my view on that, I say that with regret because I would like to believe that, that all societies that we can, can, handle it. Can, can bring people there and create Americans, create Canadians, uh, create Englishmen, create Dutchmen. But if you look at England, uh, I mean, Englishmen whose families have been living there since 1066 are no longer English in any meaningful way. So the idea that you can take uh, some child bride 
uh, off the boat from mere poor and turn her into a functioning British subject in any way is, I think, highly dubious. And so I do think at that, I do think uh, that at some point we have to grasp the nettle of mass immigration, which is always a sign of societal weakness. Um, whatever one feels about it in theory, a dependence on mass immigration is a sign of a structural defect in society. Final, <clears throat> final question, Mark. Let me, this will take a moment or two to set up, but I think it's evocative enough mm -hmm. to make it worthwhile. Two assessments of the future. Malcolm Muggridge, the great late British journalist, who in his later years used to tell young people when he was lecturing in this country, as indeed he told me, that we would soon find ourselves in the position of St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, North Africa, who writes the City of God as news of the sack of Rome reaches him. This flower of classical civilization, St. Augustine, who in his own lifetime watches it all slip away. That's assessment one. Assessment two, the present Pope, Benedict XVI. You write yourself, again, in America alone, quote, the future implicit in then Cardinal Ratzinger's name for his papacy, Benedict XVI. St. Benedict is born in Umbria 480, just 50 years after the death of Augustine. And St. Benedict ensured, quoting you, that critical elements of civilization were preserved and that they would emerge as the basis, basis for Europe and Western civilization. Pope Benedict XVI once quoted a Benedictine motto, pruned, it grows again. So you have Malcolm Muggridge, sorry chaps, it's the end. And you've got Benedict XVI who seems to be suggesting that after a period of struggle, rebirth. I think it was easier in the original Benedict's day. I am worried that we are delivering, uh, we are essentially delivering Western technology which can, which can peer into every nook and cranny of our lives. Uh, and we are creating transnational institutions that will end up being run uh, by profoundly illiberal sources. If you look at the biggest voting bloc at the United Nations, for example, it's the Organization of the Islamic Conference. That's an interesting mm -hmm. name. If it was, you, what, would, what would the left make if there was a group of nations called the Organization of the Christian Conference? Right. They'd be hopping mad about it. Right. But they're not about the Organization of the Islamic Conference. 58 nations who make the running, especially in things like the Human Rights Council at the UN. So in other words, these uh, international institutions that were set up mainly by the United States in uh, the late 1940s because the US didn't want to be an imperial superpower. So it created these uh, transnational institutions that, have now, uh, that, that, that are falling remorselessly into the hands of the enemies uh, of uh, liberal societies. And I think that, I think that makes it, I think that gives the second Benedict uh, a tougher job than the first Benedict has. I don't want to subscribe to Malcolm Muggridge defeatism. I'm a happy warrior. But turning this thing around uh, is going to be a hellish work. And I think at, at a certain point we're going to find little citadels, little citadels of light uh, on what is otherwise a very dark planet. In other words, I think mm. pruned it grows again, maybe, but the pruning is going to be far more severe than we yet know. Mark Stein, author of America Alone, thank you very much. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.